heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 275, covering the week of August 16th through August 20th, 2021. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like our Gab page, and subscribe to our YouTube page. The YouTube page is great. We've got all of our podcast videos there. We've got our Abbeville U videos, which are our six-minute and under videos on a variety of topics, and we have more of those planned. But, of course, that will get into my second point. And all of our lectures are there, so it's a great free resource to get all of that stuff. But if you like those things and you like this podcast and you like the website, which, of course, we update five times a week, six times if you count the posting the podcast on Saturday, then please consider a tax-deductible donation to the full extent of the law. We are a nonprofit organization, and so we do exist on your generous contributions alone. We want to do more videos. We want to do these things that help uh, expand interest in the Southern tradition. Our, our goal, our mission is to explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition, and we need your support to do that. We will be running some fundraising campaigns in the near future, so if you've got a little, little extra cash and you, and you like these things, please consider a donation. Also, give us that email address here at abbeyvilleinstitute.org. It's how we keep in touch with you. Social media is great, but email is the best. And when you give us that email address, you get a free ebook exploring the Southern tradition by 20 Abbeville Institute scholars. It's a great gift to you. Also, click on the shop tab at abbeyvilleinstitute.org. You can pick up your Abbeville Institute apparel there. All kinds of great things with the Institute. We are listening. We've gotten some feedback on the new website, so we're looking at making some changes. We've gotten some feedback from younger people. They want to see a couple of things on there that we're working on doing. So there are some things happening in the background. There always are things happening in the background. You may not see them right away. We will have another webinar this August. We haven't settled on a participant yet, but look for August 26th to be the day. So uh, August 26th, mark that on your calendars. We will have another webinar. Those things are a lot of fun. And go to abbevilleacademy.org. That's our. That's how you get those old webinars if you didn't enroll in them and you missed them you can get those abbeville academy webinars uh fifteen dollars per per webinar they're at least an hour long so you know think about it like a movie ticket right and of course you can download it and watch it forever so it's 15 bucks and it's yours and it's a great way to support the institute as well and it covers the cost for the for us to put those things there so that's why we do it but as always share the podcast around on social media rate our podcast Share our articles where you can. Let people know you're interested in the Southern tradition, even if we don't have a Facebook presence right now. And I'm not sure if that's going to come back or not. But even though we don't, you can still share our articles on Facebook. And that would allow people to see them. So um, just because we don't have the Facebook account doesn't mean you can't do that. They are illegal to be put on Facebook. So keep on doing that. It's, uh, it's great. Now, Let's talk about the week that we had. We had some really good stuff this week. Some interesting, I think, thought-provoking articles. It's particularly the article by uh, Valerie Protopappas, which I found fascinating because she looks at the war in a different way. And that's something I want to talk about. But also the article by the Reverend Larry Bean. And I want to start with that today because that article, we're looking at what's happening in the current situation in Afghanistan and American withdrawal from our troops from Afghanistan one of the things that people say to the South all the time is, you lost, get over it. You lost, get over it. So are they going to say that to American soldiers coming back from Afghanistan? Hey, you lost, get over it. Or are they going to say it as he brings up to American soldiers who fought in the Vietnam War? Hey, you lost, get over it. You don't need to go to that Vietnam Memorial anymore. You lost, get over it. What about the thousands that have died in the Middle East since 2002? You lost, get over it. You don't have to mourn those people anymore. They lost. They're a bunch of losers. Is that what we really want to say to Americans? And this is what Southerners are. They're Americans. And I think Northerners recognize that when the war was over. But this short little piece is fun because it brings up some of these issues. He says, the opponents of Southern heritage often repeat the trope, you lost, get over it. One of them told me that it was ironic that we honor both the U.S. and C.S. flags. But, of course, the postbellum states of the C.S.A. were annexed into the reunited United States. They were forced back into the Union. Therefore, 13 of the stars on today's old glory represent Confederate states. American history is incredibly inclusive as well as intricate. 
And to this day, when there is a war to be fought, the South is always overrepresented. And when Yankees retire or go on vacation, they usually go South rather than North. I don't blame them. There's no actual irony in honoring the past. History is complicated. We embrace our ancestry and heritage. This is how normal people in the real world live. That's why there are statues of the defeated Scottish rebel Sir William Wallace, not only in Scotland, but also in England. He is a UK hero today. That's why there is a statue of the rebel General George Washington in Trafalgar Square in London. That's why there are statues of the defeated Hawaiian Queen Lilu Kalani and other pre-American royals in Hawaii. And their state flag includes a symbol of the defeated mother country of the United States, Great Britain. The state flags of New Mexico and Oklahoma contain symbols of defeated native peoples. You lost, get over it, right? Many of whom are veterans of the United States, even though their ancestors took arms against the U.S. Took up arms against the U.S. Isn't that ironic as well? Another talking point about Confederate heritage is that they took up arms against the United States. As the kids say, well, duh. In fact, some of the most honored American Indians fought against and even slaughtered a lot of American soldiers, including the famed veteran of the War for Southern Independence, Brevet Major General George Custer, and 267 other members of the 7th U.S. Cavalry at the Battle of Little Bighorn, while wounding 55 more. They stripped, scalped, and dismembered the bodies of the American dead, and yet... These Indian warriors are also part of our common American heritage, honored on coins and stamps and in museums, and they hold a special place of honor among American Indians to this very day. And we, as a nation, erect statues and monuments in their honor. In 1993, Hollywood made a movie honoring the Indian warrior and combatant against the United States Geronimo as an American legend. Our modern USA is a complex tapestry of many heritages, and that includes our Confederate heritage. As for losing in battle, our fathers and uncles were defeated in Vietnam. There are many who believe the Vietnam War was not a good cause and an appropriate use of American military force. But, of course, we honor these men as our countrymen, our relatives, and as part of the tapestry of American history and heritage. And we especially honor the fallen with the Memorial Wall in D.C., the surviving veterans and family members of the dead, even those who believe the cause was less than righteous, reverently visit that memorial. What kind of person would tell the family members who honor these men, you lost, get over it? Would they say that to the visitors at Auschwitz? Auschwitz? Would they say that to the descendants of slaves? Would they say that to a mother whose children were killed in the line of duty as first responders? Perhaps no. Perhaps so. I mean, maybe. Our country has not only lost its history, it's lost its heritage. It's lost its soul. And so, I mean, the last part where he says, would they say that to these people? Absolutely, they would. The Vietnam Memorial and other memorials honoring veterans are not well liked by the left. They've attacked World War II monuments. I mean, these are things that they've attacked because they represent something else. Even if they're a victorious monument, they represent a period of time that these people on the left don't like. By the way, this blog was originally published at Reverend Bean's website, Father Hollywood. You can look that up. He does great work there. He's a Lutheran uh, priest and I mean, just a fantastic uh, writer and also social critic. So if you like this little piece, you'd like what he writes at Father Hollywood. He lives in Louisiana. But would people say this? Maybe today they would, but we don't. I mean, we honor people. But we just can't honor Southerners. It's, we, we're selective in this, and I think that's the great travesty of all of these things that happen in American society. And so I love this little piece because it gets right to the heart of the issue. What's going on in American society is a wholesale transformation of civilization. We're elevating the worst to the top and taking the best and putting them at the bottom in terms of culture. This is what we're doing on a regular basis. And so a couple of the pieces this week get into that. And I want to talk about Valerie Protopappas' piece on Thursday so it was a civil war after all. Her piece is interesting because it gets into this idea of what is the South and what is the war and what did the war mean and what caused the war and what kind of war was it? And we would say, and of course Bean mentioned, it's a war for Southern independence. It was a war for the South to gain their independence. A civil war is fought over the control of a government. And we know that the South didn't want to control the United States government. We know at that point they had left, and they weren't going to come back, even with overtures to try to make slavery permanent in the South. I mean, if you say the war was all about slavery, why didn't they come back at that point? Or even when overtures were made about uh, having the Missouri Compromise Line extended the Pacific, 
I don't think South Carolina would have come in after that. South Carolina was done. They were just going to leave. Uh, so even when, when Lincoln in 1865 said, look, come on back in, we'll, we'll postpone this 13th Amendment thing. You come back in, it could be 1890. It could be whatever. They didn't come back. They didn't come back because independence was more important than slavery. Independence was more important than anything. These people were fighting for hearth and home, and that's what they wanted, and you were going to have to defeat them entirely to have it change. But... Was it really a civil war? Lincoln called it that. He called it the War of Rebellion, but he also called it the Civil War. And, of course, people talked about that and spoke of it in those terms. And we still speak of it in those terms to this day. But was it really that? She makes a pretty convincing case that it really was a war of two nations for the control of one. What kind of nation would America be? Would it be the old American nation, if there was such a thing? Or would it be a new American nation that destroyed the old founding republic or federal republic? Would it be that or would it be the federal republic of the founders? Which nation would we have? And she brings up some of the issues, economics. She says it wasn't all about economics. It can't be. It can't be all about that because why would Lincoln abuse the section that whether they paid the tariff or not, but it's still a productive section in the United States. Why would they abuse it? And of course, you can look at what happened after is colonies, and of course the North still continued to make money on the South even after the war was over. But why would they do that? And even if you say it's a free trade zone, and Lincoln is going to uh, be going to bristle at that, I mean that certainly is an argument. But it can't be all about that. And of course, it wasn't about slavery. We know that because there were overtures for the South to come back in, as I said. But it had to be something else, and it was a cultural conquest. What kind of America were we going to be? Were we going to be dominated by New England or dominated by the South? And, of course, New England won. So we're dominated by New England, which is why you have cancel culture today. It's why you have woke culture today. It's why you have these things, because those are the political Puritans. That's what they are. And so when they come after the South, they're coming after the last vestige of traditional America. It's it. That's all there is. There's the South. There's a Southern tradition And that is pretty much it. And when I say the Southern tradition, of course, I'm talking about the Jeffersonian tradition. This is something that uh, the dimwit Michael Anton remarked when he was attacking me about, well, don't they know that uh, there's uh, all these Midwesterners out there and Westerners that wouldn't, they were former Union states and they're not going to be part of the South. Yeah, they're Jeffersonians. And how many of those people in those states came from the South anyways and moved to the West? A lot of them. And so they were Jeffersonians at their core, which is the core of the Southern tradition. This is where people like Anton, the Claremont people, the neoconservatives, they really don't understand American culture. They don't understand it. They don't understand the core of it. They live in a world of ideology. They live in a world where America is a proposition nation, and that's it. That everybody can just get on board with an idea. It doesn't matter who you are, your background, or where you're from, or None of that matters. It only matters about an idea. It doesn't matter about real, tangible things, which is culture. So Jeffersonianism has that. Real Jeffersonianism, not the proposition nation distortion of Jeffersonianism, but what Jefferson really was, which was a Virginian, his country, first and foremost. When he asked, when he was asked, can you tell about the United States? No, I can tell you about my country, Virginia. That's what he could tell you about his country. Virginia. That's why he wrote the notes in the state of Virginia. And his vision of reform stopped at his mountains. That was it. It It's right there. So he might want to reform Virginia. He was interested in education reform and other things in Virginia, but he wasn't interested in reform in in New York or South Carolina or Massachusetts. Even when he was contacted by the Danbury Baptists and he said, you know, one day I hope that religious freedom comes to you It wasn't going to come from the federal government. It was going to come from the people of Connecticut. And that's where we get this idea of Jeffersonianism. Real federalism, local matters. Place matters. Where you're from matters. These are things. These are tangible things. Ideas can't meet that. Ideas can't do it. So when you talk about the Civil War, what was lost in it, if it really was a Civil War, it was that tangible thing of place, that That part of America was conquered. That nation was defeated. I think it was still there. I mean, this is why you had the populist afterwards, and you you had some things, and there were still 
and Americans still hang on to this in a lot of ways, but the dominant became New England, and it was more about culture and power than anything else. I mean, look, you can boil the as Jefferson Davis even said it in 1850, this all comes down to power. Who wants power, and the North wants it, and they will do whatever it takes to get it. And what we're seeing with the left today is generally that. They will do whatever it takes to get and maintain power. They don't care what they have to do. They just want the power. They want the ability to control things. That's the Puritan side of them. The Puritans just wanted to control stuff. Want to control this, want to control that. Not like me, you got to be like me. It's a type of cultural imperialism that's dangerous and destructive. So I love this piece from Valerie Protopapis because it, it takes a position that's a little bit different, or I should say even in some ways a lot different, from what we normally talk about with the war. And again, as I mentioned last week, the Abbeville Institute is interested in more than just the four-year period of the war, but this is not just about the war. It's about the entire conflict between the North and the South that was manifested by four years of violence, but still is ongoing. This is what wokeism is all about. Take out the last block to New England puritanical victory, and that again is the South and the Jeffersonian tradition and the deplorables. People that want simply to have a culture that is not like them and that they can do what they want. It's, it's that that needs to be taken out because as long as that exists, there will always be a roadblock into the progressive steamrolling of America. So you got to do something. Take down their monuments. Take down their symbols. Cancel them. Do whatever you can to get rid of them because that's what has to be done to ensure that you are ascendant, that your culture is victorious, that New England finally wins, that Sherman and John Brown's body have taken over, have burned everything they can to the ground, and even Yankees on the right, quote-unquote, believe this stuff too. Now, some people on the right are starting to recognize the error of their ways. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, maybe there's something to this Robert E. Lee guy, or maybe some of the stuff is okay, but they're only giving lip service to it because they realize they made a serious and cal- horrible, seriously horrible error in somewhat agreeing with the idea that we should take down Confederate statues at one point because these people are traitors or whatever. I mean, even the Claremont Review of Books ran a positive essay on Robert E. Lee recently, which is amazing that they did that. But these people are still not necessarily friends of the Southern tradition because if, if there wasn't any of this woke rage against statues and monuments, they would be on board with taking these things down because Confederates are traitors against the great Abraham Lincoln, who they all admire so much, uh, and their great teacher, Harry Jaffa, who said all Confederates were just traitors and bad people. I mean, this is what it comes down to. So <clears throat> I love this piece from Protopapis because she gets into this idea of cultural war. Culture matters. It was about culture as well. Cultural destruction of the South and the people of the South and the Southern tradition. And so when Boyd Cathy starts the week and he says, will the South rise again? Is it going to rise again? Can we have a South that rises again? And what does that actually mean anymore anyways? We have remnants in the South. In fact, if you're, Boyd Cathy sends out an email, it's his, um, where he gets these and where I get these from. And he talks about it's the remnant. He talks about there's, there's simply pockets left in the South because, again, the South is being torn apart from the inside now. I mean, look, Georgia, you've got a razor-thin majority of people who want to keep Stone Mountain there. You've got Governor Stacey Abrams saying she wants to sandblast it, get rid of it. You've got people on the left who certainly would want to do that. Who knows how long that monument's going to stand as the left gets more and more aggressive, and they think they have cover because... They think mainstream, mainstream America supports them. So they have cover for it. When you take, down, you take down a national historic landmark in Robert E. Lee, you just take it down. Well, I mean, who's going to stop you, right? I mean, that, that monument should have been protected, should never have been moved. Nothing should have happened. But yet... We see it happen all the time. We see monuments coming down, and they're coming down by votes in southern cities by Southerners, well, at least least geographically Southerners. A lot of these people have moved in 
from other parts of the United States. I'll never forget the the article I read from some little uh, little girl in Richmond. She moved there and was offended by it every day that she had to walk by the monument. Offended her. Well, then move back to where you're from. Stay there. That'd be a good idea. That's a nice thing to do. But no, no, that wasn't enough. She had to uh, go out and protest and spray paint and destroy and then get her wish to get it torn down. This is the sad thing where we are in America. And, of course, put them at a sewage treatment plant because that's where these people belong, right? These monuments belong at a sewage treatment plant because these are essentially monuments to people that are lower than sewage. That's, that's the message. We know that's not true. We know Americans recognize these Southerners in a proper way before the last 20 or 30 years, that they were right on in their admiration of Robert E. Lee or the common Confederate soldier or Stonewall Jackson. They were right on in those things. Or even Jefferson Davis, who was an American hero before he was a Confederate president. These are things that people recognized because they had a brain, because they understood that people could be have values and uh, view things differently than we did in the 21st century or the 20th century, that they didn't have to necessarily line up, but yet they could still be great people. That's what Bean was talking about in his essay. And they honor William Wallace, the man that fought against Edward I, Edward Longshanks, led a Scottish independence movement, was beheaded and drawn in quarters, his legs and arms chopped off and put to different ends of the, of the uh, island. Head stuck on London Bridge. I mean, this was a traitor of all traitors, and yet he's honored in England as a hero of the United Kingdom. Because why? Because Scotland is part of the United Kingdom. So he is a Scottish hero, so that makes him a British hero. Just like Robert E. Lee is a southern hero, part of a conquered area, he's an American hero. That's the, that's the unification of it all. The heroes had to be represented from both sections. And Americans in the South begrudgingly accepted Abraham Lincoln. They begrudgingly accepted other Union veterans as heroes. Not always. They didn't like it all the time, but they did it. And they would have reunions where all the people would get together and shake hands and say, this is it. But we don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore because that is not the modern, woke American way. We have to have enemies and we have to have good guys And the enemies are anything traditional in American society. Even George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, these people are now enemies to woke American society. And eventually they'll have to go too. So when Boyd Cathay asked, will the South rise again? I don't know. I mean, he's he's skeptical. It's going to be difficult. Uh, Will the South be able to survive? This is some question that Clyde Wilson asked in 1980. Will the South survive? He was optimistic. 40 years ago, 41 years ago. A lot's changed in 41 years. Hopefully the Abbeville Institute will allow the South to survive. But what do we need to help make that possible as millennials come around to it and they start seeing, as they start reading things and they realize, oh my gosh, there's something beautiful about this. There's something beautiful about these heroes willing to sacrifice everything for independence. That is, that is the, this is a noble thing. It's the very definition of nobility to do that. Why are we demonizing these people? And, and, and I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. Why are we demonizing those people? Well, because they're told to. They're told to. As Boyd Cathy says, in the contemporary South, the great success of the revolutionaries has been to atomize much of society, deprive large portions of it, especially the young, of those inherited traditions, those customs, those beliefs, those memories, which have given it substance and continuity, which have served as its shield and buckler. Instead of what Southern writer Richard Weaver called a communitarian, communitarian social bond individualism, sorry, life centered around family and church and indelibly defined by region and custom. Progressivism breaks and severs these bonds, isolates individuals, and renders them subject to the social decay and dislocation which an omnipotent managerial state in league with woke capitalism utilizes to advance its vision of a future society. The millennial 
who wrote me and said, "What can young? How can we get young people involved?" Here it is. This is why it's hard because you're dislocated and because you think woke. I mean, this is cool. This is great. This is all these people are bad. But when you start looking at what the things really are, the traditions, the customs, beliefs, those memories which have given it substance and continuity, there really is something beautiful about the South. And what can we preserve in that? It's not enough just to say that these people are great. Why were they great? What was beautiful about the South? Why were people willing to die for it? Why were people willing to get their guts blown apart by cannonballs? Because that's what happened. For slaves? Give me a break. They didn't even own slaves? No. It's because heaven was a lot like Dixie. As Hank Williams Jr. said, if heaven ain't a lot like Dixie, I don't want to go. And that was it. And so music is certainly something that we win all the time. Southerners win all the time. Food, we win. You look at the dominant trends in cooking in America, it doesn't matter what, if you turn on the Food Channel, it's Southern in so many ways. It wins. The Obama you know, bash where they had all this strange stuff, that, that's not winning. Southern cooking wins. People like it. People want to go, and they want to go, and they want to experience something romantic, which is why they love southern mansions. It's why they come to the south, as Larry Bean points out. Who wants to go to the north? Nothing there. I mean, you had to watch a baseball game in Iowa. It's the only thing there, right? But I mean, of course, those people are Jeffersonians, and so seeing the farms and the quaint towns and all these things, and that's something people like. So when you look at Tom Daniels' piece on Wednesday, What Makes This Musician Great? Another installment, Maybelle Carter, not June Carter Cash, but her mother, Maybelle Carter. It's that Tennessee down-home feel, and he gets into all kinds of other reasons. I'm not going to steal his thunder. He's got really good stuff here. Again, Tom Daniel is a real treasure for us to have in writing these pieces for the Institute uh, because he really knows his material when it comes to music and why it mattered and why she was so good why she was so good but more than anything it's um it's that feel of home and place and you look at some of the videos and they're sitting there playing you know their guitar and a dress and very traditional but yet so good he says in 1970 the carter family became the first performing group voted into the country music hall of fame what took so long which means that maybell and sarah were the first women voted in as well Meanwhile, countless guitarists all over the world probably don't realize how much of their own playing is influenced by Mother Maybell Carter. Everything from that familiar shuffle strum to playing lead and rhythm simultaneously. Not bad for a Southerner, he says. And that is the key to it all. So another great piece by Tom. And again, this is going to be an ongoing series. He's got another couple in the queue, right? So we've got one of these for a week, and this could go on for about a year that we have these beautiful pieces on Southern music. That's something worth preserving and something worth championing, saying, you know what? When you bring up music, the North has nothing on the South. And as long as we can write the songs, they can write everything else, because the songs will eventually win. In the 1960s, this Irish romanticism came back. Why? Because Irish folk music became trendy and popular, and people loved it. And so you had, for example, Tommy Makem write the great song, Four Green Fields, which is about Irish independence. And it was a huge hit all over the place, even in the UK. And it was just something that people admired. The spirit of independence, these people that wanted just to be free, to have their own government, a government of their own, to have, and in the last part of it, of course, the fourth green field is Northern Ireland, and there's a call to take it back. And it's a beautiful tune. So if we can continue to write the songs and the stories, eventually that will come back. That's why we need artistic people in the South to do these things and not make it corny, right, campy. Make it real. And in that vein, when people send us poetry and, uh, and things, you know, stories, we like Thomas Holtz, uh, I'm sorry, Thomas, Travis Holt stories. Excuse me, Travis, I knew you listened, so I don't, I'm sorry I messed up. Travis Holt stories, 
uh, are so good, and we've had um, uh, Avriel, uh, Avriel uh, writing poems for us, and um, we, we just have good people, Jim Kibler. And, uh, we, ha- we just have good people doing these things, and that the reason for that is because the South still has a story to tell, and there's still something real and tangible about it. And I want to talk about this last little poem that we ran on Friday. It's a great little poem. And it's by Tom Riley, and it, it's very short, one stanza. And it's called, it's titled The American or American Aurelius. Esteem you for your genius just a little, but most of all, your people love the peace that stood behind your fury. In the middle of your much troubled heart, there dwelt Circe's. From trouble's weight and unrestrained increase, from victory's excess to feats to spare. The calm philosophers of ancient Greece had nothing on you, old Marcia Robert there. Oh, sure, you had a temper and would dare to show it off now and then. Was that a flaw? Our flawed humanity can hardly care. Only the smallest souls here ought to gnaw. Your whole life built a monument to duty, a structure now unparalleled for beauty. Think about that. His whole life was a monument to duty, unparalleled for beauty. Only the smallest souls here opt to gnaw, to chew at it. The smallest souls. This is such a great... I mean, again, they can write all the stuff they want. They can tear down the monuments. They can do that. And they will. But as long as her tradition survives, it will come back. Because people will recognize it. It will be back. The green flag was illegal in Ireland for years, and it came back. These things can come back as people see the real side of these things, and they realize the mistake that's being made. I think that's what's going through Claremont right now. Oops, we made a mistake. It all has to come back, but it will take time. Until next time.